Welcome back to another episode of The Case for Mars. In the last episode, we talked about the Spirit and Opportunity rovers and their overall missions and what they discovered on the surface of Mars. In this episode, we're going to cover a little bit about the Curiosity rover, what instruments it had on board, what it was made of, and how it landed on the surface of Mars. So let's talk about that. So the Curiosity rover, let's talk about the dimensions of it. So it was 7.2 feet high, 8.9 feet wide, and 9.5 feet long. Now to put that into perspective, that's about the size of your small car, maybe a sedan or a smart car, but still, that's much bigger than how big Spirit and Opportunity were. Now something that's interesting about Curiosity's wheels are they're designed a little bit different. They have a very thin outer layer with a strong inside. And the tracks on the outside actually spell something in Morse code. When the Curiosity rover roams across the surface of Mars, it actually leaves a trace of what comes out to be JPL, which is an acronym for Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is the place that designed and built the Curiosity rover. So when you talk about the wheels, again, you have to talk about the speed. Curiosity is actually a little bit faster than Spirit and Opportunity, but not by much. Its maximum speed could cover about a football field in 45 minutes. Now, Curiosity actually isn't powered by solar panels. It's powered by an RTG, or radioisotope thermoelectric generator. Now, what that means is it has a radioactive core, or in this case, about 11 pounds of plutonium. And as that decays, it releases a lot of energy and heat to the surrounding thermocouples. And when the change in temperature from the inside that's really hot to the outside Martian air, which is pretty cool, that change in temperature causes a voltage, which creates energy that Curiosity can run on. Since the Curiosity rover is larger and has a lot more power, it's able to do and conduct more experiments. So the first experiment, or the first camera it has, is the mass camera. And the mass camera is used as about the basically the peak, the top point of Curiosity, which takes true color images of the surface so that we can analyze the surroundings and get good pictures of what it's looking at. Then it has its navigational cameras, or the hazard avoidance cameras. And these are primarily pretty close to the ground. And again, similar to Spirit and Opportunities nav, nav cams, they are used primarily for navigation. Now, the last instrument I want to talk about is the ChemCam, or a laser spectrometer. So at the top of the mast cam, there's also, at where the mast cam is located at the top, there's also the ChemCam. And what this does is it looks at different rocks within a small range of Curiosity, and instead of having to go over and drill into it with the drill bit that it has, instead it can use a small laser to pinpoint that rock and then shoot the laser out right at the rock. And what it's able to do is when it burns the rock or the mineral or whatever it may be, it detects what gases come out of that. And it uses something called spectrometry to understand what element or what mineral it was depending on what gases are exhausted. So now that we've talked about the design and the instrumentation on the Curiosity rover, let's talk about its launch date. So it actually launched on November 26th of 2011 on a rocket called an Atlas V. Now Atlas V are used commonly today and they can get up to 860,000 pounds at launch. After Curiosity launched in November of 2011, it took about nine months for it to transfer to Earth to Mars and landed on the Martian surface on August 6th 2012. Now, how exactly did it land? So let's go through the landing sequence. The Curiosity rover entered the Martian atmosphere, traveling hun traveling thousands of miles an hour. But as it went through the atmosphere, it actually slowed it down to about a thousand miles per hour. But this is still way too fast to land on Mars. So there had to be a supersonic parachute that deployed. And what this was able to do, it was able to slow it down even further, but not to the point that it could still land safely. So after it got to it was about the critical speed that it could be, it detached the parachute and retro rockets burned on a, what was called a sky crane. Now why was it called a sky crane? That's because it used its downward cameras to take pictures and understand exactly how far off the surface of Mars it was. And then once it knew it was a hovering position and about 21 feet off the surface, it then lowered Curiosity on a tether that was only 21 feet long to the surface of Mars. And right when the tension in that rope started to give, which meant Curiosity was on the ground, it detached the tether 
and the sky crane flew away to a safe distance, leaving Curiosity by itself on the surface of Mars with no lander and no crane attached to it. What was even more phenomenal about the landing sequence was it the sky crane or the heat shield or the supersonic parachute, but the fact that all of that had to go by itself. At the time that it landed, Mars was seven light minutes away from Earth, meaning that it took anything that we sent from Mars, any communication from the rover or satellites nearby, took seven minutes to get back to Earth. Why is that a problem? Well, the entire landing sequence took seven minutes, which meant we would, the rover would say, okay, I'm about to land, we would get that, and then by the time it said that, it would already be on the Martian surface, either in a thousand pieces or in one piece, ready for us to take pictures. Now, those seven minutes, everyone at NASA had no idea whether it was successful or whether it was just going to crash onto the surface. So everyone back on Earth had to just wait and see as the events played out and saw that Curiosity safely landed on Mars. In the next episode, we're going to talk about what discoveries Curiosity has made and what the overall goal of the rover is and how long it's going to be running for. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.